what a beautiful day. <laughs> your Corvettes. Yeah, your Corvettes. Your Corvettes. <laughs> we got a Batmobile. <laughs> What's up guys? Well today is a video that I have had lots of requests over many years to have and today we're going to drive what is known as the world's only turbine powered Batmobile! Which is basically a replica of the Michael Keaton era Batmobile from the late 80s and early 90s except this one is actually powered by what it was supposed to be in fiction, a military turbo shaft engine. It idles at 20,000 RPMs, you're cruising along with a gas generator around 30,000 RPMs, and a maximum output of approximately 40,000 RPMs. Makes the better part of 400 horsepower, and is currently powered by Jet A, and it drives the rear wheels through a four-speed automatic gearbox that has been modified to be manual shift only. So today I want to show you uh, the drive across Ohio. Uh, I wasn't expecting to drive it like that, so it was a great opportunity for this video. Uh, I was pretty steamingly angry when I was driving this uh, because I got screwed over by a dealership um, and it is, ugh, they want it on display and let's just say they told me everything under the sun to get whatever they wanted and then kick us out when they didn't like us anymore. And I heard everything from every manipulative game in the world uh, to being screamed at uh, to one of the best performances of Crocodile Tears I've ever heard. And I hope that the dealership will please just leave me alone. Anyway, so without further ado, let's go for a ride, guys. This car does require a lot of concentration to drive. You really want to have a checklist with all the startup procedures, making sure your fuel pumps are on, cooling, all the gauges, everything like that. And obviously, you can see me sighing. I wasn't having a good day. And then put that on top of it, driving a jet engine powered vehicle across traffic and everything like that that's a custom one-off build. You really have to be paying attention. It was still fun, but my job was making sure everything goes well. <laughs> you can tell I'm pretty mad. First thing there is taking the uh, shifter, and I actually put it into a taller forward gear for startup. You can't leave it in park or neutral, otherwise your driven side will start spinning really fast, and then it'll, it'll clunk in at the end. So you always leave it in a forward or reverse gear when you're going to start or drive. So that's the first part. There I'm testing the fan, just making sure that the cooling fan will work for the engine bay, and you don't heat it all up. Obviously starting to turn on the gauges, you have your right bank over there, you can see the oil pressure flashing. Uh, it's not started up yet, as well as the EGT below it. Boom, there's the startup procedure. When it hits 3,500 RPMs in the gas generator, you click on the fuel, just like that. Then you wait for it to come up to 10,000 RPMs. When you hit 10,000 RPMs, I can turn off the starter generator as well as the igniters, which is gonna happen there. Now, as long as it's lit and still going up, it should come up to just under a 20,000 RPM idle, which we'll do here in a moment. I'm having my hand ready in case I need to shut off the fuel. There's also a manual fuel shut off, and I'm running through my head all of the procedures in case there was an issue with fuel oiling or anything gone wrong. But now that it's up to idle, everything's good. The car is starting to make thrust and we're starting to move. Just creeping making sure that my pneumatic suspension is where I want it to be as we're coming out of this parking lot. Obviously being mindful, it is a very large car with a lower visibility. It's not impossible to drive, but you really have to be on it paying attention. So here we go. Just checking some switches, paying attention, minding the surroundings, really watching out. You've got uh, two exhaust nozzles that you wanna, you know, you wanna keep it at a safe distance from anything else out there, it's blowing a lot of air. All right, so we're now looking on the street, getting going. Yeah, no power steering, actually, and this is relatively light, but it is a uh, rough and tumble car with <laughs> no BS going on. Pulling the second gear, coming out on the street here. Just getting driving. Yeah, I'm uh, as classy as I possibly can be telling that dealership what I think of them. <laughs> anyway, we're coming up here. we got a stop sign coming up, just paying attention to some things. That was the canopy latch, making sure it's secure. I didn't do it just yet, just in case something wasn't right and I had to hop out making everything go. Since the car was on display, um, I 
you know, really didn't have the opportunity to prep it as much as I would like. I had to kind of get in there, make sure batteries and everything are good, give it a quick look, look over and get out. I was also pretty angry because they were letting people sit in the car, even though I very clearly told both the manager and owner uh, not to, for a lot of reasons, including safety. So when I got in there, it was pretty clear there were people in it, not to mention social media posts of people getting too deep in it. So I really wasn't happy with that place. But anyway, we're off. Uh, gonna hit the highway, gonna be smooth cruising, so I feel better about that. You know, the thing's running beautifully, and it's a lot of fun, but I'm still concentrating really well and paying attention. Uh, you can see the oil pressure gauge flashing right there. That was because of a setting. It was going slightly beyond the high setting, just to let me know. Uh, since the engine hasn't heat soaked yet and warmed up, the oil pressure come down a little bit. Obviously, I'm paying very close attention to the exhaust gas temperatures which if there was an issue or a spike in temperature, that would tell me if there's something wrong. Of course, if you get a very high EGTs or exhaust gas temperatures, you could hurt your engine internally. I don't want to do that since it's a very old military circle engine. It's running good. There's no reason why you should ever have to uh, fix it or do anything as long as you run it well. But uh, getting on the highway here, about ready to pull another gear. Let's see. Will I shift? Or probably. And how you drive it is the gas generator there at the top left of where that iPad is, that is the gas generator RPM gauge or tachometer. The one in the middle, just to the left of that red covered switch, is the output shaft speed, which is typically zero to 6,000 RPMs, very much normal to a normal car. So when I shift gears versus up or down, I do so based upon the output shaft speed of the generator. So if I'm just cruising, I might be cruising at lower RPMs. You might be anywhere from 1800 to 2500, something like that. Kind of like you would in a normal car. Uh, but if it starts getting high, you grab another gear uh, or you go lower so you have the torque you want or a little tiny bit of engine braking, but not not a lot since it's not a reciprocating engine. It doesn't really work like that. So it's important that your brakes are really good. Uh, there is no clutch pedal in this thing, obviously. Uh, and I left foot brake it. You could right foot brake the car as well. But this gives me more control over both braking and throttle. Since it's a turbine engine and you are running this car off of thrust and it takes some time for it to spool up, you can't just rev it up and dump it immediately. So if you're a light and you want to come away from it quickly, you need to right foot brake a little bit to build up your pressure. Right there, you can see me shaking my head a little bit. I was kind of just testing it, seeing how it was taking the throttle inputs being off on. You want to be very smooth. Um, if it's not happy or if it's not quite right in the mixture, you might get it like a, a lean pop or something like that. You wouldn't want to flame out. The car's running beautifully um, for not being driven in some time. And uh, I did change the oil on it a few months back, so it's, it's been quite happy. And obviously, you want the batteries up. If you look through the cockpit here through the steering wheel, you can see a keypad there that you can utilize with getting the internet on the iPad, obviously, doing some startup procedures, shutdown procedures, etc. But right now, it's pretty much smooth cruising. Uh, in a moment here, there was a state trooper on the median on the left who saw me cruise by, and I'm like, oh boy, <laughs> I don't really want to get stopped right now. I don't know if you can see him coming up there. But uh, he didn't even pull out, didn't bug me. He's obviously like, oh, that guy probably knows what he's doing. I'm just going to let him go. And uh, today I really wasn't trying to have loads of fun and be ridiculous. So I was uh, obeying all the traffic laws as well as I can, looking out for my fellow motorists and just, you know, getting on by, taking a nice country drive. Um, I, this is one of those things I enjoyed a little bit more afterward because my primary focus was just driving the car smartly and safely. It's a one-off prototype built car with really, really cool componentry. And um, you, you have to pay attention to things like that. When you're a race car driver and you're building and testing race cars, it's just the same as this or if you're building experimental aircraft. Um, it's not fun until you're super confident you put lots and lots of hours and everything in it. And right now it's still kind of testing. I haven't driven in a while, so I'm paying real close attention coming here through the light. There's going to be some roundabouts and such coming up and just really, really paying attention, looking ahead, seeing what traffic's doing. Traffic's starting to pick up. There's a bunch of people in the roundabouts there. So I want to pay attention. Roundabouts can get kind of silly with Americans especially. So I don't want to have a problem and people careening in the side of this bad mobile here. Also, the car draws an absurd amount of attention. When you're cruising by it, anywhere from 20 to 30,000 RPMs maybe. Um, so people tend to react stupidly when they're driving. Um, they either don't go when they should or go when they shouldn't uh, <laughs> and do other things. So I kind of need to realize that people may react badly. Um, not to say badly that they see the Batmobile, but badly because they're not driving well. So, you know, I got a little bit of stress on there, but it's, uh, it's entertaining. So getting out of the city, kind of getting a country road, looking forward to just hitting the road. Cars are driving beautifully, though. 
and it is a beautiful day out sunny that was that was nice that got rid of a lot of my stress of the day I was mostly happy just to get it out of there and now that I'm getting out of the congested area of the city it's starting to open up get away from these roundabouts get away from the traffic lights but I'm still really hardcore paying attention to traffic people are obviously gawking at the car stopping and checking it out I just want to make sure that somebody doesn't get frustrated coming bombing out you got to see all my facial expressions too I have to change gears occasionally and uh, cruise along you still see some of the traffic I'm just being super mindful of what other people are doing and other motorists uh, basically same thing you'd be doing if you're riding a motorcycle uh, obviously I'm more protected in this particular car than a bike but uh, certainly don't want to have any issues or cause anybody an issue because they're so just enamored and blown away by what they're seeing anyway starting to move along better you know the car is running beautifully the uh, the oil pressure is great um, you know everything's going well but I'm also reminding myself since I don't drive this thing often, of all the procedures. So in case there was something to happen, I want to make sure that I know exactly how to shut it off, exactly how to get it out. And uh, you saw me look over there just a moment ago. I was looking just to see exactly where the manual fuel cutoff valve was. There is a manual lever which can cut all the fuel coming from the uh, electric pump, which is behind me in the fuel tank back there for the fuel line, the hard line that goes by the cockpit to the engine. So I can kill it right there, even if there's an electrical failure. If you look there at the shift lever ahead of it, you can see the red covered switch. And if you recall from the startup procedure, that one was there to initiate the starter generator and the igniters for starting it up. And then when I click that cover back down, it turns off the starter sequence and lets it go to the generator sequence. But the switch just to the left of it, where you can see an orange or amber light at the bottom, uh, that is the fuel solenoid. And the solenoid, if, it, if you move it to the top position, that's on. If you move it to the bottom position, that's off in terms of it allowing fuel to flow there at the high pressure mechanical pump on the engine that's gear driven. Now the fuel solenoid, if you click it into the middle, the solenoid will stay locked in the position it last was. So if the solenoid was up and in the on position and you click it to the middle, you're no longer putting electricity um, through the magnetic windings, but it will lock in the on position. So I usually will do that just so I'm not sending electricity through it, potentially wearing any kind of windings or something that's a bit older. It's just being mechanically sympathetic. Of course, if you want to shut off the car, that little switch right there with the amber light below it, you click that down. And uh, we're going to hear that here at the end of the video. And it's actually shutting it off sounds really cool. I was just pushing the uh, oil pressure gauge there. I need to reset the upper limit of it. It flashes at a lower setting than it should. Uh, and I was pushing the button because, frankly, that little blinking light was driving me crazy <laughs> from building it. Going to pull another gear there, just cruising along, probably 50, about 50, 55 miles an hour, just going with the flow of traffic. And checking it out, I was contemplating maybe banging it into, uh, oh, I guess that is fourth gear, never mind. Um, so, yeah, top gear, but I was uh, looking at it. Sometimes you might want to downshift, just really paying attention the whole way. Uh, but it's nice, smooth sailing. It's a pretty day, and it's as enjoyable as it's going to be, you know. But the funny thing is... When you drive a turbine-powered car, which I, I know that sounds ridiculous, I, I realize that nobody does that, but it makes such unusual sounds, and it's not sound dead. So right now, I'm, I'm listening. I'm hearing different whirring noises, different uh, mechanical sounds that I'm not accustomed to hearing in a car. I can hear tires. I can hear different bearings. <laughs> Giving the camera a little smile. All right, Casey, you're starting to have fun. I get it. You're kind of smiling. Anyway, so... You can, uh, you can start hearing funny sounds, and you start listening to the nature of how the thrust goes through the motor. You know, you've got planetary gear sets spinning at maybe 30,000 RPMs and rotating that output shaft speed down to 3,000 RPMs. So there's a lot of mechanical sounds as well as like thrust type sounds and resonance frequency that sound like howling and like whirring and whining that are perfectly acceptable and perfectly normal, but you know, kind of freak you out when you're listening to it. So right now I'm sensing everything happening. Using obviously my ears, I'm smelling if there's anything, you know, funny smells happening. The Batmobile here does have cool air intake from up ahead of the engine for the cockpit to keep the cockpit fresh with cool air outside of there. Uh, now we're slowing down a little bit, so I'm gonna grab a lower gear, keep the uh, keep the output shaft in a good torque range in case I need to speed up or whatnot. Really paying attention, to everybody. Looking at the rear view camera monitor, um, there's. There would be no sense to have a rear view mirror on it because there's no rear window. Um, that's actually still legal. There's a number of production cars, a Lotus Exige, that has no rear window, or at least you can't see. Uh, so for this car, there's a high definition monitor and some high definition cameras that allow me to see out the rear and a great field of vision to know what's happening. Uh, 
Um, my forward vis vision is pretty darn good. You're not going to be seeing the sky super well, and it's a long, tall hood. So you need to pay attention like you would in a big front engine race car. I can see generally quite well to the left and the right. Uh, the bit of the rear facing blind spot on the right is of course made up for by the cameras. But uh, it's funny how much it is like being in a, in a small jet airplane and driving that. Uh, except you just happen to be on the ground with a lot more traffic so you being careful there and drive along. Um, starting to get some reactions from people. I'm really not looking for that. But we're in a smaller town here. I was going by an ice cream stand. Somebody darn near dropped their ice cream and uh, some guys on motorcycles completely freaked out. It was kind of funny, some of the guys riding behind me had the camera on and there were two guys in newer C7 white Corvettes that were matching. They're both convertibles with the top down. And I'm sure when I went by, <laughs> they heard it. Shoo! The sound and the, of course, the smell of that burning jet fuel um, was very different. So they probably kind of freaked out. And the guys in the chase car had some uh, fun but cocky words to say about that. Which is also what makes it a lot of fun to be part of this and doing it. For everybody involved, uh, it's fun, it's fantasy, it's excitement, it's theater. Uh, and it's also engineering, it's craftsmanship, it's art. I think the reason everybody's enjoyed this build so much is because it just it excites everything that is about being a car guy, about building, and still being a kid at heart, even if I kind of stressed out, sighing, and having a frustrating day. It was still neat, and I'm glad that we can share this with you guys right now, so I hope you're enjoying it as well. I know there's gonna be some people out there that are like, okay, so I wish you didn't do the voiceover, this is really dumb. But at the same time, too, I'd really like to give you guys the opportunity to hear it and everything going on. If I just uploaded this with no talking at all, it probably wouldn't get very good views either. So maybe I'll upload one just for everybody that wants to hear it straight. But anyway, got to really pay attention. Came to a stop, got it in first gear here, pulling away, coming out of there, just reasonable. You know, I'm in a uh, little bit of a populated area, so I want to be cool. Everybody just kind of chill here. I'm in second gear. It's good for relatively higher RPMs, uh, sp speeds, I should say. It's geared rather tall. There's been some people have asked me what I think the top speed of this vehicle would be. Of course, it's only going to be making about 400 horsepower, shaft horsepower, uh, and it's a very large and draggy body. So your top speed is going to be limited by how draggy it is, I mean, all those big fins, everything. It was designed to be an evocative and exciting you know, character, effectively, for a movie, um, and part of the fiction and fantasy of that, rather than being a high top speed. So I don't know. I, 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 wouldn't have an exact guess. I might say somewhere in the like 170 miles an hour range. I have a feeling there's going to be just too much drag on the body for what that engine outputs. I know a lot of people say there's a lot of higher horsepower turbine engines, and that's very true, but all it's going to be doing is making massive amounts of heat and burning loads of fuel. I can't recall exactly because I wasn't paying attention to my fuel consumption, but the one or two times I looked, I was burning about 16 gallons an hour and I was not going very fast. So that can tell you, I mean, turbine engines do have high fuel consumption. So if you're gonna use one, it'd be better if you were at higher uh, horsepower output going real fast. Uh, but that's why turbine engines are great, things like airplanes, boats, and uh, back in the day for Indianapolis racers, because you'd be going large amounts of power for a long time. Anyway, the drive's just about to come to an end. Uh, so I'm gonna shut my mouth and let you guys hear when it shuts down. But uh, thanks for watching, guys. Catch you later. enjoyed today's video and naturally that you will subscribe but please click that bell so I can continue to bring you wholesome and entertaining automotive content. Also a huge thanks to Avalon King Ceramic Coating. They're supporting this channel and making this all possible. But more importantly I'm looking forward to using it on all of my vehicles including my old dirt bike. Ceramic coating bonds directly to the surface of your paint, trim, and plastics to give a long-lasting shine that beats all waxes. It lasts for years and it's easy to maintain. I've got it on my Viper right now and my car has never looked this good. So give them a try. Again, thanks for watching and I look forward to see you next time.